great. Well, let's turn to all you conscious agents in the audience for your questions. Um, <laughs> could I have, yes, the person there, uh, microphone there, and also I'll take, um, well, yes, maybe I'll send the microphone to the people on the front too. Yes, thank you. And then if I take, if I take all three questions, we'll do a combined response. Yes, Hi, thank, um, you. thank you so much. Um, my question is mainly directed to you, Donald, and I just I wanted to know, uh, perhaps I've misunderstood you, but I wanted to know a little bit more about what your first statement you made when you said that you did this research on these creatures and, and you said that the ones that had a worse sense of reality uh, weren't necessarily, uh, what did you say, that they were more, that they, having a worse sense of reality didn't make you less able to reproduce, that there wasn't a correlation there, right? right. That someone's survival as a species isn't correlated to uh, how much they see that is real. And I wondered how you figured that out if we don't know what is real. You know, like how right. could... Great question. How, uh, and, and secondly, um, uh, I wanted to know, I just feel that with this road and this grand auto theft met metaphor, which I understand, I mean, how do you feel about being in a world where as time moves on and as we evolve, we are less and less able to move off that road and drive off a cliff or turn around and like, look up at, you know, to go off grid, like we're less and less able to go off grid, potentially, if we're increasingly restricted to reality where we're just doing adaptive actions. So great. yeah, Thanks. that's all. Thank you. Okay, great, lovely. Um, well, maybe you should deal with that as it had two questions within it and then I'll move right. to the people on yeah, the front. Yeah, I might yes. forget otherwise. So. Yeah, so, so do you want to start with, you know, exactly how do we know that if we don't have right. a sense? That's a, that's a great that question. Real. It, 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 turn, it might seem like magic, but it turns out all I need to assume about reality in this proof, it's, so it's a theorem. Uh, what I'm telling you is a theorem of, of evolution by natural selection, that organisms that see reality as it is are never more fit than organisms that see none of reality and are just tuned to fitness payoffs. And it turns out that's true regardless of what reality might be. I didn't need to assume anything about reality except that it has a set of states. And all I need, and so, it, and the, the key idea is a little technical, but in evolutionary theory, there are things called fitness payoff functions. They're functions that depend on the state of the world, and they tell you how many fitness points you'll get for various actions. And all you have to do is analyze those fitness payoff functions. You can ask how many of those fitness payoff functions would actually preserve some structure in the world, like a total order or a topology or whatever it might be. And you can prove using combinatorics, simple mathematics, you can prove the probability of a, that a payoff function will preserve any structure in the world is zero. And that therefore, since natural selection tunes us to the payoff functions and the payoff functions themselves do not preserve structures in the world, our, our senses could not possibly be tuned to structures in the world. It's actually a straightforward proof. Great, thank you. Um, do you want to do the bit about ad increasingly adaptive <coughs> right. process? Right, so I don't see this as constraining us at, at all. I think this is liberating. I mean, when, when to, we, thought that, we thought this was the final reality. What this says is there's another aspect to reality that we've never been open to before. The reason I got into this was because there's a problem in science called the hard problem of consciousness that we can't crack. We're trying to figure out how neural activity causes your experience of the taste of chocolate or the smell of garlic. How does that happen? We have these correlations between brain activity and conscious experiences. There is no scientific theory that can explain it. The reason I got into this was, I be was beginning to think, we're doing the problem the wrong way. We're assuming neurons create consciousness. Why might that be wrong? And that's why I looked at evolution and realized, oh, neurons exist only when I perceive them. They couldn't possibly boot up my consciousness. So now we have to rethink this hard problem of consciousness, which is one of the biggest open problems in, in, in science today in a f completely new framework. That's why I'm doing the conscious agent stuff. Right, great, thank you. Okay, so we have um, well, hordes of questions on the front. I'm just gonna take this person here and the person with the check, yeah. Hi, um, this is a question for Donald. Um, I was just trying to understand something, and um, <laughs> yeah, trying to understand something. Um, and you were saying, I think, um, that um, that the game theory strategy doesn't need space and time. And I think I wrote down some phrase you said, which was something about actions and consequences. And I was sort of thinking, well. Isn't a game theory strategy and actions and consequences meaning that you have to have a cause and effect and time and space to have a game theory strategy and actions and consequences? If you strip out uh, space and time, you can't have a game theory strategy. Right, so uh, that's a great question. So, so the first thing is that in, in evolution, evolutionary game theory, we don't even talk about genes 
and things like that, DNA. It's only about strategies that, that are competing with each other for, for resources and so forth. And all you need in, in the mathematics, and, and this is, by the way, this is the mathematic, when we talk about evolution by natural selection, this is the mathematical content of it. We've discovered this in the last 40 years. That's what we mean by evolution by natural selection. So, so it, it, it captures everything that we need, and it doesn't, the, the notion of causality that's in there does not require even space and time. It's all you need are, are strategies that lead to certain outcomes, and the causality that you, is not even in space and time. So it's, it's a very, very powerful tool. It's, and and the, the power of it, uh, by the way, I should mention something you asked me about, which was, what about mathematics? I said that evolution means we don't see the truth about the real world or physical objects. What about math? Haven't I shot myself in the foot if, if math isn't true? And it turns out math doesn't fall under my theorem. Be and the reason for that is this. You need to be able to reason about fitness payoffs. A creature that doesn't understand that two bites of an apple give you more fitness payoffs than one bite of an apple is, it, regardless of what an, whether an apple is true or not, it's just the fitness payoffs. If you don't understand that you can get more payoffs by doing certain things, then you will not be fit. So there are selection pressures to actually have some minimal competence in mathematics and logic. Not, there are not selection pressures to be geniuses, but just enough to beat the competition. By the way, that's, evolution does not try to make geniuses. All you have to do is just beat the competition by a little bit and you're fine. Great, thank you. Um, has someone got a question for the panel as a whole? Though it's lovely to hear from Donald too. Have you got one for everyone? Uh, I'm afraid my question is <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll turn to you at the end. I'll, I'll remember or remind me collectively. Um, uh, yes, the person there, please. So uh, when you guys are speaking about, you know, reality not being something we can understand, uh, obviously it really makes you think of Kant very strongly. And I want to know if that, that does imply, you know, that the way to seek knowledge is to figure out perhaps how, what's the process by which those icons are created or, or the process by which creates the way we view a reality. And if your ideas are so similar to Kant, do you have... I think his biggest criticism was you're making the assumption of self. Does your, do your ideas um, rely on that? And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, for the lady all the way to the right, you seem to be saying, you know, we exist in the world, we need this to react. You know, does that kind of help you to think, you know, we, we exist within the world? And, and maybe if you make the assumption that there's an outside world separate to us, that assumption is too much. And that's where um, the, the hubris comes in on their end. And actually, that brings us somewhat to the, what you mentioned, Hilary, about the self-reflexive problem as well. Do you want to, do you want to go first, Maria? And then I'll so so uh, the position I'm taking is anti-Kantian. Kant was the uh, anti-realist par excellence in conceiving of the world as the thing in itself existing out there. And then the phenomenal world is a world that we construct through our concepts, etc. For Kant, uh, we all constructed the world the same way, through the same categories, rational categories. I think for Hillary, there will be different ways of constructing the world. So that's, that's a departure from Kant, but the basis is in Kant. For me, on the other hand, there is another tradition in philosophy where it says that we do engage directly with the world. We get things wrong, and we make lots of mistakes, but also we try to get things right. So there is no ultimate truth that we, cre we, we discover, but we just move towards the truth. And that, that, that's a completely different tradition in philosophy and not the yeah, Kant yet. Yes, yeah. Do you want Stephen to respond? Yeah, I'm not uh, Stephen, quite which which element to respond to. I mean, I think that um, uh, you know, Kant started from a position of saying uh, mm, we, uh, we need to account for how it is that we know things and build a structure of how there is knowledge even though um, he, he has a, he says we can't you know, describe the noumenal. Um, Strangely enough, I, I started in a reverse situation of thinking, uh, isn't the contemporary situation that we know that we, in a sense, know nothing? Um, and and how, how is it that despite the fact that we know nothing, we are able to intervene? And when I say you know nothing, that we are unable to give um, a definitive account of anything. 
uh, what, what, you know, in the 20th century, one of the things we've uncovered is the extent to which with the frameworks that we thought delivered us with definitive outcomes have gradually been undermined by a recognition of their perspective character, that they're limited to language, culture, history, society, and so forth. And so uh, we, we don't have the, the, that knowledge framework, and yet we're able to intervene. So in a sense, I'm coming from the opposite issue of thinking we, we haven't got that knowledge, but how is it that we are able to do all of the things that we can do and to build a framework which enables an account of how that's the case? And it, of course, I have ended up with something that does have some elements of similarity with Kant. Um, but uh, as Maria was saying, I would choose different ways of describing the detail of how we create our in my firm, closures, and how the, we give them meaning, and how it is possible that we're able to do things, um, even though it's not backed by some ultimate stuff. Great, thank you. I've just seen there's a piece of blue paper that's gone up at the back, which I know isn't real, but it means I only have two minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to really briefly honor my promise to the, the man, if you can have a really quick question, which we'll answer very briefly too. Uh, it, it seems like your theory is similar in some ways to pragmatism, that the the reality as we perceive it is what is useful um, and I wonder and also in, in some ways to Buddhism in the sense that we what we perceive is essentially illusory and I just wondered if you'd found after having come to your theory from your uh, evolutionary game theory models if the narrative uh, was reminiscent of anything if there was any other theories or perhaps people that had approached the same conclusions but from different ways of thinking about the world that you came across Quite quickly. Very, yes. Yeah, yes. So it, I, I differ from pragmatism in the sense that I also think there is a deeper form of reality. So the pragmatic thing comes from evolution within our interface. Um, and the, the interface is pragmatic, it, but there's a deeper reality. So in, in terms of like Kant and so forth, Kant says the phenomena, which is what I would call the interface, is our empirical reality. But he says there's a noumena that we can't see. My difference with Kant is that Kant said we cannot do anything about the noumena. We can't give a theories of it. And that's really bad for um, job security in science. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't go there. So, so I, it's my job as a scientist to try to pr propose a theory of objective reality. Kant might be right, but I can't go with it. I think that proves you are a pragmatist. I'm a pragmatist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to thank you so much for coming. Wonderful. And thanks to our wonderful panel, Donald Hoffman, Hilary Lawson, and Maria Fagrami. Thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV. Thank you. That was lots of fun.